My name is Avi Paulson. I'm an assistant professor of mathematics at Virginia Tech. And welcome to part four of a series of videos on exploring Fourier series through the lens of linear algebra. In the first part of this series, we looked at inner products and norms from linear algebra. In part two, we explored orthogonality using inner products. The highlight of the series was part three, where we introduced Fourier series as best approximations. And now we've come to part four, where we're going to look at the Dirichlet kernel. The objective of this part is to be able to define a concept called convolution and explain how Fourier series can be obtained as convolutions with what is called the Dirichlet kernel. And these are steps that we take in order to try to prove the convergence theorem that we saw in part three that tells us that Fourier series actually work as approximations, that you actually recover your functions, assuming that they just have finitely many jumps. But with that, let's move on and do some math. In part three of this sequence, we saw the full expression of a Fourier series, which is an infinite sum. Now, in order to explore whether that sum converges or how it converges, you need to look at partial sums. So what we have here are partial sums. That is, we look at the sum only up to some level, up to some level capital N. That is, we only look at cosines and sines up to cosine of capital NX and sine capital NX. Okay? But with the coefficients defined exactly as before, and we want to understand how this sequence of functions converges as n goes to infinity. Now, we make a little observation here, a simplifying observation. If you pair together a cosine and an identical sine, that is, with an identical n, well, we can write out what the coefficients are. They are, have very specific uh, formulas, 1 over pi with an integral. Okay? And now this, these cosines and sines that sit outside the integrals, well, they're constant with respect to the variables that you're integrating with, so they can move inside the integrals. And you can combine everything into one big integral. Now note that the terms you get when you combine this into one big integral all are multiples of f of t, so you can factor that out. Now, the tr even though it may look bad at the moment, then note that the trig functions that we have in there, we have a cosine cosine plus a sine sine, and they're evaluated at, at sort of corresponding points. Now, what you may recall from good old calculus is that there is a trigonometric identity that allows you to simplify this. It allows you to simplify it into a single cosine of nx minus nt. So combining coefficients from a Fourier series is possible by getting an integral, a simple integral of a single cosine with a function of f. Now, how is this helpful? Let's go back to the trigonometric uh, sum, that is, the partial sums for the Fourier series. Now, what you have one is that you can write out the constant term plus then the simplified terms where you have already paired together the appropriate cosines and sines. Okay? Now, these are n plus 1 integrals that you have, but you can combine this all into a single integral. And all of the terms have integrals of something times f of t. And so now if you gather all these things inside, you get this expression, 1 over 2 pi plus this big sum times f of t which is being integrated from 0 to 2 pi. And this whole mess inside within that big parenthesis is something that we call the Dirichlet kernel. Now note there that is being evaluated at x minus t, but like if we write it out being evaluated just as at x, you see it's a sum, well, it's a constant term plus cosines with ever-increasing sort of n's inside. Okay. Now, so if we were able to understand a little bit better that Dirichlet kernel, we would presumably better understand the partial sums for Fourier series. So that's one of our goals here. Now, let's first look at the integral of the Dirichlet kernel. How, how big is it? What is the net area under the Dirichlet kernel? Well, you have an integral of a sum of a whole bunch of things. And so let's just break it up into a sum of a whole bunch of integrals. Now, integrating the first term, the constant term, is easy. That just yields 1. 
What about the other integrals? Well, these are integrals over intervals along 2 pi, over, over a period of the respective cosine functions. And we know that cosine has net area 0, so all the terms after the first one disappear and give you 0. So it's 1 plus a whole bunch of zeros, so you just get 1. Ah, so the net area under the Dirichlet kernel is 1. This is a fact that we'll use a little bit later on. Now I wish the Dirichlet kernel had a better uh, expression. And one can actually make that happen. Now let's recall from trig the following trig identity. If you multiply a sine and cosine, you can expand it into the difference of two sines. How is that going to be useful? See, Remember that the Dirichlet kernel has a whole bunch of cosines. So let's multiply the Dirichlet kernel with a sine. Carefully chosen sine. It's a sine of x over 2. Okay. Now, if you look at the big sum down here, then the first term is just multiplying the constant term of the Dirichlet kernel with the sine. Now, for the next term, well, there you have a sine times a cosine, and we expand it by the trick identity. So you get a sine minus another sine. And you keep on going like that down the Dirichlet kernel. You, each time you have a sine times a cosine, you expand. Now, of course, this looks very complicated now. It seems like you've achieved nothing at all. But this is a telescoping sum. Note, the first term, the sine x over 2, appears in the first parenthesis, in the second term. Okay? We have a minus the same quantity. Ah, they cancel one another out. And if you keep on going like this down the sum, the sine over 3x over 2 cancels with a term from the third term in the sum and so forth. The only term that survives is the term sine with a 2n plus 1 times x, only the highest sort of order terms of the sines. And so this tells you that the sine of x over 2 times the Dirichlet kernel equals whatever is left when your telescoping is done. And this gives you, well, a simple formula for the Dirichlet kernel. Now you may have some concerns about evaluating this formula at zero, but go back to calculus. Take some limits. And note that if you take a limit as x goes to zero, then this actually goes to a number, a number that may depend on n, but it does not blow up. So this is actually a very nice description of the Dirichlet kernel. And this is another thing that we'll use a little bit later on. What is a convolution? Well, a convolution between two, two pi periodic functions, f and g, is denoted by f, and this is not supposed to be f times g, it's f convolved with g, and we use that star to denote the convolution. And what it is, is that it's an integral from 0 to 2 pi where you sort of mix the two functions. You take f of x minus t times g of t. Okay. And one of the nice things about convolution is that it doesn't matter which order you do it. Maybe you should pause the video and see if you can do a change of variables to obtain that identity, that the order does not matter. Now, without wanting to go too much into detail about all the wonderful properties of convolutions, which are very important in analysis, then let me just say that the partial sums for Fourier series are actually given as convolutions where you convolve your function with the Dirichlet kernel. And so if you go back a couple of slides, pause this video, scroll back, you will see that that was exactly the formula. Now, because it doesn't matter which order you convolve things, and you can switch the order of f convolved with, D, with the Dirichlet kernel, and you get this following expression for the partial sums. Now, why is that all, all of this useful for the convergence theorem for Fourier series? Let's take a little step towards that. Now, granted, there are jumps possible in your function. So let's just think about a point where your function f is nice and smooth. There are no jumps. Okay? And so what you want to show is that your uh, partial sum for, for the Fourier series actually converges to your function at such a point. Okay? That is, as n goes to infinity, the partial sums should be converging to your function if it's not a point where a jump happened. Okay? In other words, you want to show that the difference between the partial sum and the function is going to be small. In fact, goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Now, one thing you can do is that, well, the partial sum you can write as a convolution, as we have done here in the first term in the sum, minus f of x. But remember, the integral of the Dirichlet kernel is 1. So instead of writing just 1, I can write integral of the Dirichlet kernel. Now, f of x that is outside the integral can come inside. 
and you can combine the integrals into one expression where you're looking at the difference between f at x minus t and f of at x and you're multiplying this with the Dirichlet kernel. This turns out to be a key observation in proving the convergence result. Let's see why. Let's draw a picture of the Dirichlet kernel. Here's a sketch for n being somewhat large, something like 13 or so. And this is a sketch of what the Dirichlet kernel looks like between minus pi and pi. Now note that the functions we're dealing with are 2 pi periodic. So instead of integrating from 0 to 2 pi, we can just as well integrate between minus pi and pi. Okay? And observe that the Dirichlet kernel focuses around 0. It focuses around, so note in the integral, the Dirichlet kernel is being evaluated at t. So it sort of forces the t to be close to 0, you think. And if t is close to 0, then the f of x minus t minus f of x, well, the two evaluations of f of x should be close. They should be close to 0, which sort of indicates why the sum should be small. And when the t is not close to 0, you can see that the value of the Dirichlet kernel drops off. So you think that things sort of disappear. Now, this is sort of a heuristic argument. It is more detailed than that. And there are some serious problems with the Dirichlet kernel that make it bad. For example, it oscillates. It's not always non-negative. It oscillates. It can be negative. So it's more than just this that makes the convergence of Fourier series work. But this at least gives you an, uh, an idea. And I'll leave it as an exploration for you looking through the full proof of the convergence result that I stated. But this gives you the key ideas. Now, with that, we have reached sort of the end of this video. And we can summarize what we have done. So this part four was on the Dirichlet kernel, where the objective was to be able to define convolution and, and explain how Fourier series can be obtained as convolution with the Dirichlet kernel. The highlight was the formula that we saw that the partial sums for the Fourier series were, in fact, the Dirichlet kernel convolved with f. And then we explored the implications of that, in particular, how the Dirichlet kernel sort of spikes up and de-emphasizes values that are far away from 0 as n goes really large. Now, I hope this exploration of Fourier series uh, was enlightening to you and got you motivated to look at more topics. I hope I left enough open questions for you. But with this, I want to conclude the video. And thank you for listening. Please leave comments. Thank you.